welcome to all participants to this seminar uh, Options for Hydrogen in Transport. Um, Bart, Somers and I will be your host today of this event. Um, my name is Erik van der Heuvel. I am director of the Netherlands Platform for Sustainable Biofuels. Um, this seminar is a collaboration between uh, the Netherlands Hydrogen Platform, Tino Automotive, and the Platform Sustainable Biofuels. Um, the webinar is a part of a, a new fuels and uh, engine program of the platform, and all the focus areas of our platform in this year are developing the context for biorefineries and mobilizing sustainable biomass feedstocks. We have invited Bart Somers, Assistant Professor of Future Fuels and Engine Development, and also Platform Board Member, to explore, together with six experts, the various options of hydrogen and transport. Um, before I hand over to uh, Bart, uh, I would like to make some uh, additional remarks on procedures. As you may know, at the end of this session, we have a Q&A session. Um, you have received, if, if you have registered, uh, a WhatsApp phone number where you can actually bring your message to. Please indicate who you are and to whom you address the, uh, the question so that we can take them in the end of this session and uh, try to answer these questions. Um, for now, I would like to hand over to Bart Somers. Bart, can you uh, shed a little bit of light on why we have this seminar? Thank you, Eric, for your kind introduction. Well, in Eindhoven, we just started a new initiative, which is called the Zero Emission Lab. Uh, that's a collaboration between TNO Automotive, the TUE, Shell, Province of North, North Brabant, and uh, that's basically it. Um, we, we, of course, there is a challenge for future engines. Eh? They need to be clean locally and have a low carbon impact. Well, in this seminar, we want to look into what possible low carbon fuels there are available in the future. Obviously, green hydrogen will play an important role in this future economy. But also other low carbon fuels are good candidates. And which viable routes are possible, that will be uh, talked about in this seminar by a few speakers. So maybe it's a good time already to start to, do, to go to the first speaker, uh, if, if, uh, if I'm correct, and that is Richard Smokers. Richard, um, you are working as a principal advisor of sustainable transport and logistics for TNO and representing here the TNO program Voltagem. Um, Voltagem is researching possibilities with e-fuels. Well, my question basically is, what is to be expected the coming years with the production of e-fuels? So please, uh, Richard, the floor is yours and shed your light and share your vision. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Sorry for a bit of delay. I pressed the wrong button and uh, clicked away the connection. Um, but I'm in, uh, on screen now. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Yes. Um, well, the next one then. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks very much for this uh, opportunity to uh, to present uh, the results of a project that uh, has been carried out over the last one and a half years with a uh, large number of uh, of stakeholders. Um, it was a project under the flag of uh, Voltagem and in cooperation with Smartport and a large number of um, uh, companies and other organizations uh, from the logistics sector, the industry, as well as uh, knowledge institutes, uh, and also wider participation in stakeholder meetings uh, from even a larger amount of, uh, of, of companies and organizations. In this project, we, uh, we made a comparative assessment and some road mapping activities to uh, look at the suitability of e-fuels, including hydrogen and uh, hydrogen carriers for a number of modalities, including, um, say, heavy duty uh, truck transport, uh, so long distance uh, trucks, uh, ships and aviation. Um, we looked at, uh, say, technical uh, suitability of these, uh, of these fuels, but also at environmental impacts. We looked at uh, various economic aspects to find out uh, which fuels would be suitable for which applications. Um, in uh, looking at the economics, we looked at, uh, at future costs throughout the value chain uh, to see if, for instance, from a cost perspective, certain fuels might be more interesting than others. Um, and we also checked the requirements that the use of these fuels would have on the renewable energy production in the Netherlands and associated land use. 
And as a final step, we uh, made an inventory of what kind of actions various stakeholders can take to uh, promote the development and application of these, uh, of these fuels. The results, uh, uh, basically what I'm presenting today is a, is a pitch of the results of this project. So a very small excerpt of what we've done. Um, a paper is in presentation, of, is in preparation, a vision paper, which will be published uh, beginning of May, hopefully, as a uh, Voltagem vision paper. And uh, this can be... Uh, obtained by sending a mail at uh, info at voltagem.com. Next slide, please. Yeah, in this slide, uh, you see uh, the different fuels that we uh, have been uh, looking at. Um, it's all uh, looking at, uh, at e-fuels. So it starts with hydrogen. Um, we looked at a number of hydrogen uh, carriers, including uh, E-LNG, E-methanol, E-diesel, and E-kerosene, um, and also included ammonia as a non-carbon-based uh, carrier for, uh, for hydrogen. Uh, the graph uh, shows uh, an example of a table of which we have many more in the reports underlying uh, the paper uh, from, uh, for instance, the, uh, the assessment of the technical feasibility of various fuels in relation to the vehicles and the vessels and airplanes in which you use them. So we uh, explored various aspects of technical feasibility. And the table here, as an example, simply uh, shows uh, the assessment of the feasibility of onboard storage for the different fuels in relation to, uh, to the different applications. Uh, and there, of course, you look at energy density, uh, both in terms of volume and in terms of weight, including uh, uh, tank weight and tank volume. Next slide, please. As an example of, of one of the striking results that we got from the uh, from the assessment, uh, this slide shows some uh, uh, some cost results. Uh, we basically assessed uh, the cost throughout the uh, the value chain, throughout the energy chain, of these different um, hydrogen carriers compared to hydrogen for truck transport, for inland shipping, for short sea shipping, uh, and deep sea shipping. And we also have some uh, graphs for aviation, but these are not included here. Um, where you look at production costs, at uh, the cost for compression or liquefaction, for distribution to, uh, say, the, the filling stations for the, the vehicles or the vessels, uh, and also to cost in, uh, associated with uh, adaptations of the vehicle that are needed to, uh, to be able to, to use the fuel. And a very interesting result that we got is that if you use, um, say, middle-of-the-road uh, cost assumptions for electricity and for the cost of obtaining CO2, that actually for most applications, the uh, differences in uh, cost of the fuel, total cost of ownership for these fuels are very small and are within, say, the uncertainties that are associated with uh, this assessment in any case. And we're looking at future costs, so these are um, these come with a, a significant level of uncertainty. So the differences that you see in these four graphs for these four uh, applications are basically uh, within the, the, the uncertainty bandwidth that you have for this type of assessment. So basically with um, middle of the road cost uh, estimates, the conclusion is that from a cost point of view, there's actually not a single winner for these uh, applications. Uh, however, if you go to more extreme cost assumptions, for instance, uh, taking higher, uh, using higher electricity costs or higher um, costs for obtaining uh, the CO2, uh, which may also depend on the way in which the CO2 price is calculated, is factored into, uh, into this equation, uh, then you see that certain winners do emerge and that in some cases, for instance, hydrogen becomes favorable uh, or ammonia for other applications. Next slide, please. Yeah, some more uh, conclusions. These are just uh, teasers uh, to make you interested in uh, in the paper. Uh, it's, it's by far not a complete overview of what we've done. Um, but if you look overall at, uh, say, the summary of results in terms of uh, feasibility of the different options, uh, there are a couple of clear conclusions. One is totally obvious, and that's from all these fuels uh, for aviation, actually only e-kerosene is a, uh, a meaningful and feasible option for replacing uh, conventional kerosene. If you look at uh, e ammonia, um, based on the assessment, it's considered unsafe for trucks, but can be used in, uh, in ships and is especially from an economic point of view interested, interesting sorry, in case of high CO2 costs. Uh, the three hydrogen carriers, e methanol, e diesel, and e LNG, are all feasible both for trucks and for ships. Um, and as said, in terms of costs, do not have large differences there. Um, 
Hydrogen uh, is also applicable for both trucks and ships, uh, but is especially uh, uh, interesting in cases where electricity prices are high or CO2 costs are high, and it's more suitable for shorter distance applications than for long distance applications. Uh, we also looked at the, uh, at the space requirements associated with producing these fuels. Um, on my own faces in front of what I'm trying to say. Um, the total demand that we estimated for uh, for this type of fuels could be in the range of 1,000 petajoules. So the example here is for 960 um, in the case of methanol. And we looked at, say, the size of these facilities, how much space do the, um, uh, the, electro the electrolyzers take, the, uh, the synthesis uh, uh, plants, the, uh, the capture of uh, CO2. Um, and in principle, this sort of demand, uh, this sort of national demand could be covered by an area the size of the second uh, mass fluctor, which is uh, uh, significant but feasible. Uh, an important question in that context, by the way, is uh, how much of this fuel you like, will actually be needing in the future. And there the graph, uh, the, the lower right graph is interesting. If you look at the energy consumption for mobility in the Netherlands, um, there is, say, the domestic consumption used for uh, domestic transport, land-based transport, including uh, uh, passenger cars, trucks, inland shipping, trains, that sort of things. Um, but this is actually only a third, roughly, of the total amount of fuel that is consumed in the Netherlands. The other two thirds are used for bunkering, uh, bunkering for ships and for airplanes uh, in our uh, main ports, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, to some extent, and uh, um, Schiphol. Richard, can, can, I, can, I ask, can I interrupt uh, briefly because I understood that uh, Bart has a question about the uh, DME. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. yes Richard. Uh, very interesting uh, study, I must say. I, I hope I can get it uh, when it's ready. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Um, what I have one, one question. You, you, you specifically uh, uh, put in the mix uh, e-diesel, mm -hmm. but you don't mention EDME or EOME. Is there is, is there a specific reason for that? Um, yeah, well, I, I, I don't know it by heart. It, it should be traced back to the start of the project. We started this project, uh, I think, one and a half year ago. And at that point, uh, in view also of the available budgets, that is, this is not a huge study. It's uh, it, um, There was a lot of stakeholder involvement. The amount of study work itself was rather limited. So that means you have to make certain choices. And DME, OME are very much, say, um, uh, related to or uh, fairly similar to the methanol pathway. Uh, so they're, they're not excluded as an option uh, uh, for technical reasons. They have been excluded just to limit uh, the scope of the uh, of the work. Um, but there are, at the moment, there are several uh, follow-up steps being uh, programmed for this work. And I think also given the, um, the increased attention again for these fuels, uh, 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 they should be included in follow-up steps. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask also a question, uh, Richard? Uh, what do you expect that the timeline of introduction of these fuels will be? For these e yeah, well, that's that's actually my last graph. So if I, we go back to uh, to the okay. to the slides, then I'll come back to, uh, to that question. And so first, uh, to uh, j just go back one uh, to finish yes. what I was saying here. Uh, one, important yes. question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Important question for the longer term is whether in 2030 and 2050 we will still be catering for international aviation and international shipping the way we are doing now. Of course, the uh, position of the Dutch main ports, Rotterdam and Schiphol, very much depends on the uh, abundant availability of fuels at low costs. Um, but things may change in view of, say, the transition towards a sustainable global uh, economy. Uh, and that has a significant impact on the amount of this type of fuels that you would need within the Netherlands. And also the question whether you want to produce them yourselves or the extent to which you uh, want to depend on import of these uh, of these fuels. The last graph is uh, coming to uh, to your question. Um, we uh, made an indicative roadmap uh, based on uh, say all the stakeholder consultation in the pro in the uh, the project and uh, the studies that we evaluated. And uh, overall conclusion is, is that in the next decade, you will see increasing amounts of, uh, of pilots um, and first, uh, first pilot plans for production and pilots also on the application side. But uh, I think overall still the consensus is that we will not see significant amounts of these fuels being used before 2030. Um, and I think your question relates to exactly the sort of debate that is now starting on how can we accelerate that in view of the... Um, <coughs> 
Grünel Brem, die Directive, die, äh, uh, the, 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 uh, And the picture that's now sort of clearing up on the demand for biofuel, also from other sectors, the demand for these e-fuels might be larger at, sh at shorter timescales than uh, uh, mm -hmm. is currently yeah. uh, seen in this sort of roadmaps. And um, I think uh, one of the interesting questions, and that's already popping up also, for instance, in the context of the uh, mission-driven innovation programs that, uh, that we're now carrying out in the Netherlands, is to see... Um, how we could accelerate uh, this sort of um, uh, developments by looking at what the robust technologies are. And for instance, methanol production could be a robust element mm -hmm. of a future system that may, uh, well, you at this stage may not yet decide which fuels exactly go to which applications, but where you know that as a feedstock for a, a number of both uh, industrial and transport applications, methanol could be a, uh, um, a feasible uh, first step as a sort of no regret option. Yeah. I think that's part of the uh, discussion we need to have in the in the coming year uh, to really see if there are um, say clever ways of accelerating this uh, development without making the wrong choices, investing in things that create a lock-in at some point. Thank you, Richard. Very clear presentation, I must say. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, Maybe there will be some questions during the, the Q&A later on, but for now we have to uh, move over to the next speaker. Can I just say something briefly before we step up? Uh, because I understood already there are some questions whether the slides will be available and, and will be shared. Uh, yes, of course, but you can already go to the website www.duurzamebiobrandstoffenplatformduurzamebiobrandstoffen.nl and there's on the special team site, uh, Fuels and Engines, there's a, a special site on this workshop and there you will find all the um, presentations already in PDF format. So that's already for those who are okay. looking for the presentations. Okay, please Thank go you. ahead, Bob. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Richard, once more, thanks for your presentation. So You're it's now time to, to go over to, uh, to Stefan Janbloers. Stefan, uh, you are working for TNO as a business developer in the biorefinery uh, area. Um, Correct. So obviously, ah, there you are. So you ha I, I think you have a, a, an excellent view on what is possible from that point of view towards the, the fuels market. So please, if you will, share us your views. Thank you, I will do so. Yeah, um, Richard already hinted uh, and mentioned uh, the Renewable Energy Directive. I think it is good to start from, uh, from that perspective. Um, in the Renewable Energy Directive, it states that in 2030, 3.5% uh, of the fuels should be advanced fuels. Um, and, and just to give you an idea on how much that is in Europe, to, to replace the three and a half percent, one would need about 100 plants of 200 million liters capacity. Or, and we work in the area of uh, thermochemical conversion, so if people are uh, also in this area, uh, we need three to 400 plants of 200 megawatt capacity to just replace the three and a half percent of, uh, of fuels, which I think is an enormous enormous challenge and um i can i can only imagine that there is not going to be a one size fits all scenario um it was already just shown i think in terms of uh, just only liquid fuels uh, there will be a, a great demand also in the future for aviation uh, shipping and heavy duty transport for those areas it will be very difficult to uh, to electrify for instance or to find alternatives other than uh, a liquid fuel uh, for some, hydrogen might be an option. We will come to that uh, in, in this session, obviously. Um, but there is different transport modes, but there is also different energy sources. And um, I work in an area a lot where there is um, a discussion on converting biomass as, as one of the options, uh, which I think is a great, a great um, way to at least uh, renew part of the fuels especially for the liquid fuels that, that are uh, still required also in the future. Um, so there is different processes. And like I said, there's not going to be one size fits all. I believe there will be different processes. Um, and in these um, bio processes, and you can think about, for instance, uh, fermentation or, or digestion, but also gasification, um, there will be conversion of biomass. So that's basically the long carbon cycle, CO2, taken up by the trees and the agricultural residues, but also in part municipal waste that in processes you can convert to heat and power, obviously chemicals, but also fuels. And when you burn fuels, 
you will have re the recycle of the CO2 again. But during those bioprocesses, also often there is, a, let's say, a source of CO2 which is very concentrated. And that is a very interesting source to combine with hydrogen when available, because that CO2 uh, from various uh, um, industrial streams, you can then convert to e-fuels, and then you can look at integration of the biofuels processes with different types of fuels. And that is what you've seen now in, the, in this slide, for instance. Um, I've depicted here the um, gasification unit as we have developed at, uh, at uh, TNO. Um, it is an indirect gasifier, which means that um, we, we exclude basically air, but you get a synthesis gas um, and, and some uh, methane typically formed and CO2. And from that product gas, you can make, for instance, methanol. And from methanol, you can go to gasoline and DME. Um, and this is just examples of, of let's say, uh, the variety of fuels that such a technology can really um, uh, produce. And it also shows you in yellow, the highlighted parts in this case, where you can have integration options easily with um, electrolysis and when you have the hydrogen, but also not to forget the oxygen. Because when you have pure oxygen, you can often also increase, let's say, the efficiencies of, uh, of a gasifier. Um, if we look at the next slide, it just gives you an example of uh, a process that we are um, developing within TNO. It's on the next, uh, next slide, and it's called sorption enhanced DME synthesis. Um, it just shows you that if you have a carbon dioxide source, in this case, um, uh, to be combined uh, with hydrogen from an electrolyzer, we developed a process where we can um, in one step, basically convert the carbon di dioxide with the hydrogen towards DME. And in this process, basically two steps take place at the same time. One is the absorption of water, which is formed in this process. And thereby you can shift, let's say, the equilibrium of this reaction to the right side, to the DME side. Um, and that really helps you because if you, if you don't do this, uh, you end up in, in uh, first a methanol synthesis where you have a lot of CO2 recycle and later on a methanol recycle when you do the DME synthesis. So it's an, an example of an elegant way to do, let's say, electrochemically production of DME. But also this can then be very easily integrated with, for instance, a gasification process where you uh, have, a, have a synthesis gas that is also a combination where you have CO and CO2 and hydrogen, and you can go to a DME synthesis. So those are the things that we are looking into uh, today. And there are downs, downstream of, let's say, uh, gasification options to convert various types of, uh, of biomass. The question obviously always is, is this, is this interesting? Um, if we, if we go to the next slide, I, I try to depict some work from Handula who, um, who uh, published some work in, in terms of the, the pricing, levelized costs of, uh, of fuel. Um, because, I mean, for, for every technology, there is, there is a cost involved. And I don't think we should compare with fossil fuels because uh, in any case, whatever type of biomass or electrofuel, it will be very difficult to compete, let's say, with the with a fossil source. But depending on, let's say, um, um, especially the price of electricity, when you're talking about um, um, electrofuels, it becomes, uh, when, when the cost of electricity is really low, it becomes interesting to look at these e-fuels or to have a hybrid version to combine with, for instance, a gasification option can also be other types of, of biomass conversion, but in this paper, it is specifically on, uh, on gasification. And you can easily see um, in this graph, for instance, the, the levelized cost of, uh, of fuel, which is in this case in euro per gigajoule to just compare these different fuels. Um, I must say that the gasoline in this paper is being produced uh, through methanol. So it is a methanol to gasoline uh, synthesis there. Therefore, the gasoline is always more expensive than the methanol because it is an additional step. Um, and then you see that the traditional um, gasification is not, yeah. Stefan, can you um, speed up a little bit because of time? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is almost finished. Yeah, the gasification is a, a technology that is not so much dependent on the electricity price, uh, the electrofuels is, 
And what you see is that if the electricity price drops uh, below, let's say, three euros per gigajoule, um, then, um, then it becomes favorable to use these fuels, but also the options to combine uh, are in the range of two to six euros per, per gigajoule. So think about um, two, one to two cents uh, per kilowatt hour. In the next slide, um, you see something similar, but then for the biomass, because then obviously the biomass, the price of biomass is very much determining, let's say, the price of the fuel. And just to give you a reference, um, and, and you can look it up later, if you look at demolition wood, for instance, that is 1.9 euros per gigajoule. Uh, clean wood pellets are 9 euros per gigajoule. So you have, you're already in the le lower left part. So if demand grows, I, I would suspect that also the prices of those biomass and re uh, agricultural residues will increase. And therefore, uh, e-fuels become more and more interesting. Um, so in short, um, it, we have a challenge. There is a, a lot to do and we have to replace a lot of fuels. Um, there is an urgency. We, we, if we want to do something in 2030, we should start now. Look at high TRL, like gasification. And um, as I said, uh, and if, if uh, things change, we have a, a larger production of hydrogen, cost will go down. It will be very interesting to combine these technologies together. Thank you, Stefan. Very clear. Yeah. Totally agree with your, uh, with your saying that we should speed up right now. Um, I have, I have one question um, sure. regarding to your DME uh, setup. Uh, you stated yeah. it was at TRL 6. Yes. And what, well, what we are now... Need? Um, so the, the next step, we are um, building this technology in a, a container size uh, unit, and we're going to travel around um, um, the Netherlands where we have different sources of, let's say, uh, different uh, sources of CO2 different uh, off gas streams and there we are going to produce the dme and um, and do some more testing but that's the, the final step before we go to uh, the full scale uh, production i would say so you, you take you take the co2 from from industrial processes exactly as a sort yes. of carbon capture uh... yeah yeah so there's different technologies that can be enhanced but it can also be just an off gas um, where where uh, you have some co2 in it because this this sorption enhanced technology that works really well, so you can you can easily yeah. Um, yeah, do these two steps in one. So it, it doesn't need to be directly pure. It does help. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So sorry, we're running out of time, Stefan. So this is the only sure. question I can pose right now. Otherwise, yeah. I would have had okay. some more. But yeah. perhaps to us some thanks later. very much. Maybe later Maybe in the later. Q and A. Sure. So we hope to keep sure. you uh, online. I will be here. We move on to the, to the next speaker, and that actually is Xander Seikens. Xander, you work uh, at TNO Automotive most of the time, but part-time you're a colleague of mine. Um, I know you did a study on the possibilities to use hydrogen directly in a combustion engine, and uh, I think most of us are very interested in, in the results of that study. So please, if you want, share this, this study with us. Hey. Yes, no, welcome everybody. Uh, Bart, thank you for the uh, introduction. Indeed, the, um, uh, the study is uh, a DGTI study, um, a feasibility study on uh, hydrogen combustion uh, funded by RVO, MPS Diesel and, uh, and TNO. Um, if we go to the first slide, actually, yes. So um, first question uh, is why internal combustion engines? Um, there are mainly four important reasons for this. Firstly, the uh, internal combustion engine is a robust and proven technology, not only in road, but also in uh, non-road applications. It's, uh, of course, an established industry. We know how to uh, design and optimize engines, manufacture them, service and maintenance them, and we also know how to recycle them. It's tolerant on hydrogen fuel quality, uh, so purity requirements for hydrogen are uh, less strict as, for example, for fuel cell application. Also, in combination with natural gas and, uh, and hydrogen, uh, hydrogen fuel quality plays a less dominant role. And last but not least, the internal combustion engine, as I will also show later, has the potential to run without after treatment. Uh, and then you don't need 
any precious metals or rare metals, which also uh, reduces the environmental impact of the system. So, all in all, um, the internal combustion engine, on hydrogen in this case, enables accelerating the energy transition towards a sustainable society, and it provides an interim solution for many applications for as long as uh, they cannot be, for example, electrified uh, when that is not available or even uh, possible. So on the next slide, um, I've shown here a graph to illustrate uh, why the combination of hydrogen and the internal combustion engine is uh, very interesting. The uh, main reason here is that it does have the potential to provide high efficiency in combination with very low emissions. Um, the graph shows the NOx emissions and the efficiency as a function of the air excess ratio, lambda. Um, we all know that from thermodynamics, efficiency gradually increases with the air excess ratio, which is shown by the green line. And NOx emissions are typically highest at slightly lean conditions and then gradually reduce when the mixture gets more lean. That's shown by the red line. Of one very nice property of hydrogen is that you can burn it in a very lean way. Uh, if you take it in comparison to, for example, natural gas, then natural gas has a limit of about lambda around two, where hydrogen can uh, be burned steadily uh, and stably well uh, above, above three. And if you look at this graph and we look at the dotted purple line at the bottom, at the very bottom, which is the uh, NOx limit of current legislation, the Euro 6 stage 5 legislation, then we see that for air excess ratios above around 2.2, that NOx emissions are already below the legislative limit which also means that above this limit, you don't need any NOx after treatment. And that is one thing that we can exploit with the hydrogen engine when we run it in a lean burn fashion. So that's one of the, uh, the concepts. Another concept is, of course, uh, the stoichiometric engine, uh, where we do have a lot of NOx, but there we have the proven technology of the three-way catalyst to uh, reduce all the NOx to acceptable levels. And in intermediate uh, lambda ranges, we also have the dual fuel solution where we combine hydrogen and diesel, uh, where we can make use of diesel-like after treatment, uh, the SCR technology to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the NOx. So these are already several concepts that we can use for the uh, hydrogen engine. On the next slide, I've made a comparison between these concepts, a high level comparison between these concepts relative to, uh, to diesel. So here the diesel engine is shown with 100% power density and efficiency of around 46%. So if you look at the concept of the stoichiometric engine, the lambda one engine with after treatment, engine after treatment system, then we see that this engine has uh, a relatively low uh, efficiency, very typical to, to uh, normal gas engines, around 37-38%, where mainly the throttling losses uh, reduce the efficiency. And power density is uh, lower as a result of um, um, the uh, displacement of, uh, uh, of air by, uh, by hydrogen uh, through the uh, injection of the hydrogen in the, in the intake. And also specifically for the uh, uh, lambda one engine, the knock tendency is uh, very high, which also reduces the, the maximum allowable load. I said a very interesting concept is the lean burn spark ignition engine with the potential of also running without after treatment. Uh, it's also 100% hydrogen solution like the stoichiometric engine. And here you can benefit from the faster burn of hydrogen to uh, have high efficiencies, diesel-like, and potentially even higher than diesel. And again, a slight reduction in um, power density is seen here, which can be partly mitigated by uh, applying EGR, and also in the future, uh, maybe by applying direct injection 
of hydrogen technology. And finally, we also have the dual fuel solution combining diesel and hydrogen, where the CO2 reduction is, of course, much less than 100 percent. Here, 30 to 60 percent uh, is feasible. Um, efficiencies in range of diesel and a slight reduction in, in power density. As a fourth feasible concept, uh, there is a future concept, which is the combination of hydrogen and argon. So here we replace the air by argon, uh, which has a much higher specific heat ratio, which uh, enables much higher efficiencies, potentially even in excess of uh, 60%. It's a future concept, um, which is also currently in development, uh, for example, at the Eindhoven University of, uh, of Technology. So what are then the, uh, the applications of the hydrogen engine that is shown on the next slide? So for these different applications uh, or different concepts, there are also different applications targeted within different time frames. So here, if you look at the 2020, 2025 time frame, uh, we mostly see the hydrogen or for CD hydrogen engine for uh, off-road application, uh, where the dual fuel application uh, is uh, feasible for shipping, near coast, inland shipping, and also uh, uh, tractors. Um, not a 100% uh, hydrogen solution. For the 100% hydrogen solutions, the main target applications in this time frame are the uh, stationary power generation, where the stoichiometric hydrogen engine with three-way catalyst may target the lower power ranges, and the lean burn concept uh, without aftertreatment targets the, uh, the higher power range. If we look at the 2025, 2030 time frame, there uh, we see a more transient solution feasible where we combine the hydrogen engine as a range extender uh, with a battery in a hybrid truck or a tractor. And as a further outlook beyond 2030, uh, we have this high efficient argon hydrogen engine for uh, stationary power generation, uh, high power. Uh, generation with local hydrogen uh, generation as input to this uh, power plant. So there are quite a vari variety of uh, applications possible where uh, we can benefit from uh, the fact that it is uh, a zero emission, close to zero emission technology um, based on proven technology uh, with a high efficiency and um, with a uh, slight loss in um, power density, which, as already mentioned, could be mitigated by future technologies like uh, uh, direct injection hydrogen technology. So as mentioned, I think the hydrogen uh, combustion engine enables an acceleration of the energy transition for, uh, for many applications for as long as the alternative powertrain solutions are not available or even possible. And with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude. Uh, thank you, Xander. We already got a question through the Q&A, which I want to pose you right yes. away. It deals with the, uh, you, you claim that the power density of a lean burn hydrogen engine is, is low, but uh, are there no ways to overcome that power density issue? By yes, so, uh, yeah, um, of course, by the application of EGR, um, you can uh, reduce lambda a bit again without increasing the NOx uh, emissions, which already uh, reduces the loss in power density. Uh, and at the same time, the EGR is used to extend the NOx limit which also allows you to generate more power uh, from the engine. So that are already 
next to uh, future technology like direct injection hydrogen uh, that are already means to reduce the loss um, yeah potentially to uh, no loss at all but that is also uh, part of, uh, of research okay thank you uh, regarding time again uh, this is the only question we can pose right now maybe later during the Q&A thanks again and uh, now it's time to go to the next speaker which is Peter van der Heide Peter you are the managing director of NPS diesel uh, and your company is an expert on diesel applications and also on modifying diesel engines and uh, I think you have an interesting story to tell here on how you did that with the hydrogen. So please, if you will, be my guest and, and share this with us. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and thanks to, uh, to the speakers in front of me, especially Sander, for his clarification. Very interesting. I'm left over with uh, the easy part, not technology, but the market side. Um, which is of course interesting uh, when you want to innovate a new product and bring it to the customer. We are uh, introduced as a diesel expert, um, which is true, but uh, over the last few years, we tend to move to more sustainable power solutions, um, which we do like and which our customers like. And uh, maybe we can go to the first slide to clarify that a little bit. Can anybody hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, the reasons for um, uh, considering uh, hydrogen in an internal combustion engine are for us very clear. Um, we have many customers knocking on our door like, can, uh, can we uh, switch from diesel to a, a new power source? Uh, <clears throat> I think, yes, we can. <clears throat> and some of our customers are looking at hybrid electrifying their uh, machinery, but they have the machinery in a remote area. So the, electric, the electrical grid is not able to provide them on short term with the power they need for charging their machinery. Um, a possible solution could be um, that you have local uh, power plants running on hydrogen with an internal combustion engine that provides the power uh, for charging systems uh, for that machinery. That's one specific application we are looking at. Um, the other one is very obvious, on-site power demand, uh, like festivals, like construction areas. Um, everybody knows the, the, the recent problems why we all drive 100 kilometers per hour. Um, there's a lot of focus on clean power solutions on every construction site where there's a diesel generator. Uh, the near future could be that those generators could be replaced by uh, internal combustion engines that run on hydrogen. Um, that's the same more or less uh, like three, a growing demand on mobile power systems that, um, that are on festivals that are, have, a, have a moving uh, place. Uh, that can be that can be running on hydrogen and the other thing is the the, the market we are in is a very conservative market um, they are a bit afraid of sometimes electrification uh, fuel cell technology because of their cost it's very sensitive they like the current diesel engines to say um, if we could provide them with a, a, a similar product that is very resistant to vibration and like Sander says fuel quality uh, and environmental impact uh, they would like to have that product so there is a there is a, a market demand which is good i think on short term for such an engine next slide please um, it's not a secret we are investigating uh, at the moment uh, uh, the Dutch built Duff Packer uh, 11 liter platform. Uh, we would like to start this year. We are already doing some research work in front of this uh, project. Um, the aim is to start field endurance testing in 2022. The nice thing is that we have already uh, partners in the project that actually are demanding such an engine. They, they feel like uh, if you can bring it tomorrow, we're open to support you, which is nice. 
Alexander expressed uh, in more detail, I think that the modern diesel engine is very much suitable to use as a platform um, for hydrogen because of the ability to resist high peak fire pressures. Um, it is equipped with high pressure uh, cooled EGR. So um, it, it's not a copy paste product for a hydrogen, but the platform is very much suitable as a starting point for developing an engine um, that can cope with the current uh, diesel engine when it comes to power density in the future. Next slide, please. Some, some applications. Yeah, this is, um, uh, like I said, uh, a typical application. Bredenort is one of the uh, partners in the project that has, uh, has a very high interest in these type of uh, solutions. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the electrical grid is, uh, is, is, is not always ready to cope with the high peak power demand due to electrification, due to solar power. Uh, it's getting more dynamic which means that uh, we could help the electrical grid by installing uh, grid solutions that run on clean fuel and uh, a conventional generator run on diesel could be replaced by a generator set running on hydrogen um, to make uh, to make it uh, to make it clean i have another example uh, this is another part of the project this is a firma herma they have uh, sustainability very high in their uh, strategy. They are currently building uh, big wind farms uh, near coast uh, on the North Sea. Um, during this construction, uh, <clears throat> they are not allowed to exceed a certain uh, noise level. And um, to prevent that noise level, they have a certain a curtain of bubbles in the seawater to um, uh, protect uh, animal life in the sea from a high noise level. It's also measured, it's restricted, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's by law that they have to do this. And uh, the funny thing is they make a green wind farm, but in order to have that curtain of bubbles, there's about 20 diesel powered generators on board of the vessel. You can see it laying close to the platform on the picture producing all the air, the, the, the pressurized air to create those bubbles. Um, and they have a special request and they would like uh, by tomorrow or next week to have those diesel uh, generators replaced by generators that run on hydrogen. And they have many of those vessels. You can imagine how many, how many uh, emissions they are producing at the moment and they would like to have them uh, clean in the future. Um, then I have, a, I think, a conclusion on my last slide. Uh, again, um, in, in our world, uh, our customers are still uh, looking or requesting very robust power solutions. Um, again, they are used to the diesel engine. If we could replace the diesel engine by a hydrogen engine, they would be very happy. Uh, it's very well accepted. Um, I think there's a very low cost of ownership compared to alternative uh, clean solutions. Um, when you look at the, the, the hydrogen engine, uh, the maintenance cost, uh, the lifetime, um, uh, the, 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 the no after treatment solution, uh, if you calculate that all down, uh, the capex or cost of ownership can be very well acceptable or close to the current diesel engines and even maybe a little bit lower. Um, there's no precious metal used. It's a, a, a non-complex technology, not meaning that it's ready tomorrow, but the components we need to use to develop this engine are available. So we think um, there's a fast time to market. Uh, again, if we could start the project this year, uh, the end of uh, 2022, we would be able to start field testing. And if that all goes well, uh, I think uh, well before 2025, there could be a market introduction of these type of engines. And then five, the last point is important, of course, we need, we need an infrastructure. Um, like I was told in the beginning, the price of the fuel, the availability, uh, the infrastructure to get the fuel on remote areas 
uh, where the customer wants to use the engine is of course uh, uh, a need. Otherwise, it's it's a it's, it's it's a nice project that will not work. So it all needs to come together at one point in time. That's finally uh, what I would like to say. Thank, thank you, you for thank you, uh, Peter. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, there there is a question already through the Q and A, and that's a question I also had. Um, so, so for this development of this hydrogen engine, you need special components, obviously. Um, do you already have suppliers for that? Um, good question. We we have uh, options for that. We have uh, suppliers, but we have options for that. Yeah, but it's not <laughs> fixed now. Because we are we just starting the project, um, so we are looking for components to uh, to fit on the engine. But uh, it's a process. What is what is, what is that uh, you think the biggest problem you will encounter? Um, I think Sander is also aware of that, but um, um, I think the, the matching of the turbocharger because of the low energy content in the exhaust could be a hurdle that we need to take, and uh, that could be a, a cost-consuming, time-consuming uh, part of the project. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So you're you're going for a lean burn variant then? Yep, we will go for a lean burn variant, uh, aiming without after treatment, uh, aiming at uh, about eighty percent uh, of the of the original uh, torque curve of a diesel engine. So that's more the, the the goal we want to reach. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this uh, this this uh, presentation, uh, Peter. And I like to be kept informed on this. It's very much on you my. Sure uh, will, but... <laughs> Thank you. For the time. <laughs> See you. Okay. Well, it's time to move to our fifth speaker, and that is uh, that's Max Art. He is the, the founding father of this company, Dense, who is developing applications uh, uh, using Max. formic acid. And uh, Max, please tell yes. me, how did you come up with this idea on formic acid? And what is, you think, the big gain on this compared to other applications of hydrogen? Yeah, we'll just thank you for your presentation, uh, and we'll see. Thank you for uh, having me. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. We can and the, okay. the slides okay, are great. coming up here. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So how we came up with it, it's actually a big coincidence because um, um, it was actually discovered on Eindhoven's University of Technology, uh, a catalyst that was able to convert formic acid into hydrogen. Uh, really rapidly, and that's how it all started. But at the end of my presentation, I will also uh, highlight the, the, the roadmap a bit that we've been uh, following uh, over the last few years. So, um, yeah, regarding the slide that is displayed at this moment, um, it's a bit the way it works, but I, I guess for all the participants, it's quite uh, obvious. From carbon dioxide, water, and uh, electricity, you can make multiple fuels, uh, amongst which also formic acid is, is an option. Um, it's a very simple molecule that's actually uh, an hydrogen molecule glued to a, a carbon dioxide molecule. And what we do as DENS, uh, we have developed a, a reformer that is able to uh, convert the formic acid back into hydrogen and carbon dioxide uh, really rapidly at pressures between 0 and 1200 bars, uh, bar of pressure. And um, we can do, of course, multiple things with that. So um, in this uh, image, it's shown that the hydrogen and carbon dioxide combination gas goes into uh, an ordinary PEM fuel cell, and there we generate electricity. Um, and then the emissions are carbon dioxide and water vapor. And yeah, the same emissions are used as, as uh, the building blocks of the fuel, and therefore it's completely uh, sustainable. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, we are. There is a bit oh. of delay. So it will be ah, okay. okay. Um, let me see. 
Great. So uh, what I've been, uh, what I tried to display over here is um, when you look at the top. Um, oh, sorry, the one of the the upsides of using a formic acid as a liquid fuel is the fact that it's a liquid with atmospheric pressures and temperatures, and that you can handle it in a relative safe uh, and same manner as you are doing with diesel at the moment. So uh, depending on, on the fuel quality, uh, the flame point is, is uh, below or above 60 degrees Celsius, which has a huge, uh, huge impact on, on the safety regulations, of course. So regarding the infrastructure, um, the liquid infrastructure can actually be reused um, depending on the material type of the, of the infrastructure, of course, but it's low tech um, and yeah, comparable to what we already have. In the, in the upper case, uh, on the right top side, we, you can see equipment, you see a power generator and a, um, an excavator. What we do uh, uh, there is we integrate a reformer into such a piece of equipment and the hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas that's being produced can either be used in a combustion engine or in a PEM fuel cell. And um, that's when we integrate the reformer into equipment. But what we also can do is place the reformer somewhere in the infrastructure, for uh, instance, on a hydrogen refueling station. And there you can produce clean hydrogen on demand from the liquid storage um up to pressures at 1200 bar and of course 900 is is, is uh, um, the the pressure that you need there and we've then done a feasibility study together with uh, pitpoint and the conclusions there were uh, were that we have a potentially cost reduction of 50 percent in capex and 10 to 20 percent in opex when you compare this uh, hydrogen refueling station to a a uh, hydrogen refueling station that is um, relying on uh, compressed hydrogen gas that has to be shipped there. Next slide, please. So, um, in short, the, the main advantages uh, of, of hydrogen, hydrogen is actually the, the, the brand name of the fuel that consists largely of formic acid with some minor um, um, uh, additions. Um, the, the energy density is quite high, 1.8 kilowatt hours per liter. Of course, when you compare it to diesel, it's nonsense, but it's, it's uh, relatively good. And you have um, 53 grams of hydrogen per liter, and that's also uh, quite uh, nice. Uh, as mentioned, it's liquid, um, limited safety risk. It is, of course, an acid. Um, so that's something that you have to take into your mind, but it's not uh, into account, but it's not uh, explosive or flammable. Um, currently, we are 100% focusing on the um, construction sector. So on the right uh, bottom side, you can see our first power generator that's actually used on a construction site to charge electrical equipment. And the upside, of course, is uh, it's no noise, no emissions, um, electric uh, electricity on demand and since the fuel is a liquid it's it's quite uh, convenient to use and highly uh, comparable to a conventional diesel uh, power generator next slide please so this is um, actually the timeline that I was referring to in the beginning of my presentation so in 2015 we've started this development uh, at the university and after a few uh, months of experimenting in the lab, we have uh, created a small car that could drive on, uh, on, uh, on formic acid. Then we founded the student team and built a one meter scale model of a Porsche. After that, we came into contact with VDL who asked if we could make it for a bus. We uh, took on that challenge, but it was just a bridge too far to scale it up a thousand times and then also make it a mobile applicable. So that's why we have chosen to put it in a stationary uh, a pilot project together with the BOM um, in, the, in the, um, the construction of, of uh, a road in The Hague. And that was in June uh, 2018. After that, we have found a dense and we have made a few prototypes and currently are working on the 25 kilowatt 
uh, a prototype and uh, that should be finished in this summer. And from next year onwards, we actually want to start to uh, produce these generators in, in series production. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's it. So currently it's it's um, TRL seven, and before the end of the year, we we would like to reach TRL eight and then uh, yeah, hit the market so to say. So that's um, uh, the story from uh, our side. Thank you, thank you, Max. Um, we got a question, and it refers a little bit to your. Uh, excursion towards VDL actually, where you try to make this mobile uh, application. And the question yeah. here is, is can you, can you make this work for a small system like in a truck? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. We have no doubts about that. Um, the only thing why we didn't fully succeed in, in making a drive uh, with the VDL bus is that we were uh, not far enough yet with the technology. So we, we didn't have enough experience and the system that we eventually made was too big and it was not suitable enough to really drive on the road. But if we would do it over again, um, yeah, definitely. But then it would be uh, sort of a, a backup charging station in a truck, right? Because yeah, your, your yeah, maximum power is like 25 kilowatts, as I see it. Yeah, the, the 12, 12, 25 kilowatt now, um, that's that's the choice that we've chosen now. But we can also do a hundred uh, or higher. Um, that's just depending on the fuel cell that we choose. So um, that, there's no real restriction in scaling that up. Any plans in going that direction? Yeah. So um, for the for the stationary uh, market, we will start uh, the end of next year a development of a dedicated hundred kilowatt system. But um, in the beginning of next year, we will already um, cluster four 25 kilowatt systems into one 100 kilowatt system. And uh, space is not really a restriction on the construction side, we, so we can yeah, do that easily in a, in a larger sized container. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Thanks, Max. Keep us posted Thank you. on the progress. Yeah. And then uh, it's already time for the last speaker of today. And that is uh, Mr. Ilko Decker, who is a big uh, methanol uh, lover, let's say. He's a chief representative of the, Euro of the um, European International Methanol Institute. And of course, he will focus on the use of methanol. Uh, so please, uh, Ilko, share your thoughts with us. Thanks very much, Bart. Um, and I, uh, I realized that as the last speaker, I'm already seven minutes into the uh, time that was originally yeah. scheduled for uh, for questioning. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief. If we can, um, if we can go to the first slide, please. So uh, yeah, as, as a quick word on the Methanol Institute. The Methanol Institute is the Global Industry Association for the world's largest methanol producers, distributors, and technology providers. And uh, it won't come as a surprise to the audience that um, we are very glad to be able to uh, participate in a workshop which is primarily focused on, on hydrogen and not so much uh, methanol. So I was quite pleasing to hear the first two speakers uh, mention uh, methanol very frequently. Um, and it actually makes a lot of sense because methanol as a molecule actually contains uh, to a large amount uh, hydrogen. Um, as you can see, there are four hydrogen atom uh, and only one carbon and one oxygen uh, atom in a methanol molecule. And I, when, when we talk about alternative fuels, um, I often mention one of the big benefits of methanol being that uh, a thousand liters of methanol actually contains more hydrogen than a thousand liters of hydrogen does. Um, and I won't go into the specifics of why that is, but roughly speaking, you can uh, calculate back that um, a cube of methanol contains approximately 3.3 times more energy than a, a cube of hydrogen at 700 bars does. So when the objective is to find a pragmatic way of distributing hydrogen um, in the existing transport uh, market, 
then methanol is a very convenient way of getting the hydrogen molecules to the end user. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. One of the key purposes when we talk about hydrogen uh, or alternative fuels in that sense uh, in transportation is the fact that we're trying uh, to reduce the carbon emissions from tra transportation. And that also means that where conventional methanol today is being produced from natural gas primarily, um, we need to find alternative pathways to produce um, methanol from biogenic or renewable sources. And um, as was mentioned by uh, Mr. Jan Bruce from, from TNO, um, there is no, no such thing as, as one simple solution. There is no, sim uh, no silver bullet. And the same can be said for the different production pathways for renewable methanol. Um, if we look at the ways that renewable methanol being, is being produced today, um, there are quite a few different pathways. Um, probably the best known example in the Netherlands is BioMCN in the Delft cell, which is using biomethane as um, an alternative to conventional methane to produce biomethanol. And biomethane may, is made through the fermentation of biomass. Um, but that same biomass can also be gasified to produce a syngas from which methanol can be made. Um, a good example is the uh, Enerchem project uh, in the port of Rotterdam, which aims to convert um, municipal solid waste and other waste streams into methanol. But um, only last month, for example, Södra in uh, Sweden uh, announced that they've started to produce methanol from their uh, pulp process, which is a craft process. Uh, in, in that process, they are able to distill the methanol from one of the waste streams. So th those are some examples of genic, biogenic pathways to produce um, biomethanol. But obviously in the context, especially when we talk about hydrogen from renewable resources, a lot of attention goes to the alternative way of making methanol, which is to use renewable electricity to produce hydrogen through electrolysis and then react the hydrogen with carbon dioxide to form methanol. Um, probably the best known example of a company that does exactly that uh, is carbon recycling in Iceland. But closer to home, uh, there's a big project in Sweden called Liquid Wind, which aims to produce uh, e-methanol from offshore wind power. Uh, and even, clo even closer to home in um, Germany, Total intends to produce e-methanol from the carbon dioxide from their own refinery. And um, as was mentioned in the first presentation from Voltechem, um, methanol cannot be used uh, in jets, although it can be used in turbines, but that's a different story. But you wouldn't want to use methanol as, a, as an, uh, an aviation fuel. But there is a project in the port of Hamburg where they, are, they intend to convert methanol into kerosene. Um, and that is why methanol makes a very interesting hydrogen carrier because the, the irrespective of which fuel ultimately has preference in the market, methanol is a very uh, versatile product that can be converted into a range of different fuels for conventional diesel engines, spark ignition engines and fuel cells. And, and that's the next part of my slide. So if we can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the use of methanol as a fuel, we often hear reference to the fact that methanol is being used primarily in China uh, at 15% in gasoline engines. But as you can see from this picture, which is quite busy, these are examples from all over the world of various methanol fuel applications. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the, the individual examples. Uh, instead of that, I made the next slide. Um, which uh, helps to structure all those different examples. And I'll spend a bit more time focusing on these different examples. And again, here you can see um, the three uh, different categories of, of engine technology coming back. We, we have the combustion engines, which are split into spark ignition and compression ignition. And then we have the fuel, fuel cell technology, uh, where methanol is being used uh, primarily as a hydrogen carrier. Now, in spark ignition, today, um, where China 
focuses primarily on 15% methanol use in um, standard road vehicles. Um, in Europe, we're testing, amongst others in Italy, with Fiat Chrysler, but also with BMW in Munich, a blend of 15% methanol and 5% ethanol. And the reason for doing so is because with existing conventional unmodified engines, uh, it helps to reduce the tailpipe CO2 emissions, which is a, a practical way for these OEMs to uh, get closer to the 90 grams uh, per kilometer um, threshold that they're required to meet. Um, but in a spark ignition setup, you can actually go to 100% methanol. And um, the uh, bubble that you see in the, um, the cars column is a, a picture of a fleet of more than 10,000 Geely taxis that operate on 100% methanol in China. And, and Geely actually has a factory in China where they can produce over 100,000 uh, M100 vehicles per annum. Um, but they don't only have an M100 technology spark ignited for passenger cars, they actually started selling a uh, truck that runs on 100% methanol in spark ignition mode. Um, and last year, they showcased this technology in a rally car that participated in the Dakar rally. Uh, and it actually did finish. I think it was in the top 15, if I'm not mistaken. Now, because methanol has a very high octane, typically, uh, most certainly those in the, in the car industry associate methanol with spark ignition engines. But um, for us in Europe, the use of methanol or alcohol fuels as an alternative to diesel um, is very interesting as well. Uh, probably the best known example is the use of methanol as uh, a fuel in dual fuel engines where you have um, a fuel oil or a diesel fuel as a pilot fuel um, but the bulk of the energy actually comes from the methanol and one example is the use of methanol as a fuel in dual fuel engines for um, international shipping uh, man from uh, denmark is supplying large two-stroke engines for international shipping there are currently 11 chemical tankers that operate on methanol. And there are, um, as to the best of my knowledge, currently seven more vessels on order. Um, but that's not the only way you can introduce methanol uh, in combustion uh, ignition engines. Uh, I think most of you, especially Bart and, and others from, from TNO, you are, I'm sure, familiar with the ED95 engine that Scania supplies for trucks and buses. But the interesting thing is that that same ED95 engine also um, operates on methanol. So if you change over the ethanol for methanol, the engine works just as well. Um, yeah, and so that, yes? I can, sorry to interrupt, but can I ask a question? How, what do you think is necessary and how quick uh, needs, let's say, the um, capacity buildup for methanol production, renewable or bio-based or... Um, so how do you see that time frame for the coming years? It's, uh, it, it's, it's always a little bit of chicken and the egg question, obviously. Um, you know me quite well. And, and uh, my personal opinion is that um, it, it, it fast is still not quick enough. Um, so we, we definitely need to ramp up that, uh, that scale. But you can imagine from an investor's perspective, you will only start committing um, funds to those types of projects if you know that there will be demand. Um, and the demand will only be there if there is sufficient capacity. But it is comparatively easy to scale up those capacities in part. Um, and the best example, I think, is, is uh, Bayou MCN in the Netherlands, where they have succeeded in taking an existing asset and um, switch over from a fossil feedstock for the production of methanol to a renewable feedstock. Now, that's a relatively easy thing to do. So that means that with the given capacity to produce methanol in large scale units, it's relatively easy to um, in, uh, increase the amount of renewable methanol that can be produced in existing assets. When it comes to projects like um, the example in Sweden, liquid wind, that requires several years, but, but it still can be done within a, a relatively short time frame, provided that 
the legislative um, foundation to make that happen and, and to make that feasible is also available. I hope that answers your question, Eric. I hope so too. <laughs> Did it answer your question? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It is. There is already one question from the Q&A, but I thought you already uh, uh, explained that. But the question is really why methanol is not picked up in ship diesels. But I think it is. It, it is. And maybe if we, we can go back to the slide, that, that maybe helps the, the viewers see the different technologies. Because I can imagine that for them, it's not easy to recall all the different examples that I've listed here. So absolutely, um, methanol today is already being used in large ship engines. And um, as Methanol Institute, we are working with uh, various consortium partners to introduce methanol for short sea shipping and in the waterways as well. Um, we actually have a cooperation with the TNO and uh, the Delft University, uh, which focuses on precisely those markets, inland waterways and coastal shipping. It's called the Green Maritime Methanol Project, where we are trying to introduce methanol as a solution for those types of markets. Um, uh, the, there is an international consortium with Lund University, which has received Horizon 2020 funding for the so-called fast water project that uh, looks at developing high-speed engines. Um, but besides methanol as an energy carrier, and, and it was mentioned a few times uh, in previous presentations, and you had a question about that as well, Bart. Um, methanol is a, a very interesting product to convert into other energy, energy carriers as well. I didn't include the example of methanol to gasoline, but I did include DME and OME. Um, DME, dimethyl ether, uh, is basically for diesel engines what LPG is for gasoline engines. So it's a gaseous products, but the very interesting uh, benefit of DME is that it can be used in standard diesel engines with very minor modifications. You need some changes in the seals and everything, the ECU, but it still operates on full diesel mode. OME is actually, uh, is an ox um, uh, it's oxymethyl ether, which is a liquid form, uh, but also derived from methanol. It can be blended into diesel. Um, typically, that is something that uh, is still very much in a, an early TRL level, whereas the DME technology has already been demonstrated by Volvo in Sweden probably over a decade ago. Um, today, there are Volvo and Mack trucks operating in uh, the city of New York, demonstrating the use of bio DME from a factory uh, out of California. Um, so one of the big benefits of those uh, ethers is that they um, avoid the, 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 the typical trade-off that we see between NOx and soot emission. So normally either you decrease in soot and go up in NOx, or you decrease in NOx and go up in particulates. And, and by using either DME or OME, you can reduce both um, aspects. Um, and maybe if we can just show the slide briefly again for the yep. viewers. I was, I, was I was about to, let's say, close off uh, Elko just because of time uh, considerations. Uh, I, so that I appreciate that. Into the Q&A. Uh, but if, yep. if you allow me one, one brief minute, uh, the only point I wanted to make is because um, the aspects I mentioned just now were all com uh, combustion engines, but the title of the workshop obviously is hydrogen. Um, there are fuel cell technologies that use methanol as an energy carrier, either for direct methanol fuel cells or in the form of reformers, where you then split the methanol between uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and then the hydrogen is used in fuel cells. And to just close off with the, the question about shipping, there's a project um, which is called the Hymeth ship, where we, we are reforming methanol on board, capturing the carbon on board, bringing it back to shore to convert it back into methanol and actually combust the hydrogen in a ship engine um, for main propulsion. Yep. Utterly interesting, okay. uh, Ilko. Thanks, thanks, Thank thanks you. for your presentation. My pleasure. Um, Bart, uh, we have now, let's say, have seen uh, your six experts sharing their various views on the topic. W what do you think, uh, and that can 
kind of kick off the Q&A session now. What do you think, what are for you the main takeaway messages from uh, these uh, presentations? Well, wh what I've learned is that hydrogen as such uh, could be a, a, a very viable fuel for, uh, for combustion engines, but there are also many, and they are actually equally expensive or, or viable derivatives of it. So I think what, what we need for a clean future is to develop these pathways quickly. And that is something that, that, that really should, should be high on the agenda, is, is make sure that we develop these crucial pathways towards fuels that are clean and can be used in combustion engines. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think we have to make very good choices. For instance, methanol, we know methanol is a system chemi chemical, so we, we really need it for all kinds of applications. But it's also a perfect gasoline. So if we could restrict in some, uh, some um, how do you say that, um, fancy way or, or smart way, the number of fuels we, we, we choose that are usable in current engines, but might have synergetic even uh, gains in future engines, then we should go ahead as fast as we can and go and set up these, these, these production pathways. But make smart choices, mm -hmm. not try to make everything, make only a few, but good, good ones. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. What, what, what I um, saw as a kind of an eye opener in this is that um, the way, let's say, hydrogen goes into the system actually uh, has different ways and uh, there seems to be a lot of synergy where you can actually link the hydrogen to another carrier of that hydrogen and the energy of that hydrogen so that you can actually let's say benefit from existing infrastructures or from easiness from being it let's say for temporary at least in the in the part of the chain exactly. being a liquid fuel <coughs> yeah, exactly yeah totally agree um if i am correct um, there are some questions now, and I understand there were some questions directed to Xander. So uh, we have invited Xander back on uh, screen again. Well, hi there again, uh, Xander. Um, uh, I'll have to I'll have take to the questions from there. Yeah. Yeah. So how how to compare the dual fuel hydrogen and diesel system uh, in comparison with the synthetic renewable diesels, like for instance HVO? Have you under, have you heard the question? Um, yeah, I have heard the question and um, I interpreted the question as a question about the difference between well to wheel and tank to wheel. Not necessarily, so I think. But if you can shine a light on that, uh, shine your uh, light on that already, that would be helpful. So with uh, with the HVO, of course, uh, well to wheel, you are okay. It's CO two neutral. Uh, tailpipe, still there is some CO2, which you have to put against, currently against the legislative limit, uh, where the, the hydrogen part, of course, also reduces significantly tailpipe CO2, uh, also in the dual fuel application, uh, where, of course, the diesel part can also be a, uh, an HVO uh, fuel. Um, if I may add on that, Xander, on a, on a tank to wheel basis, um, HVO, or so let's say renewable fuels, are viewed also as a zero emission because of the short cycle that the carbon loop is, and because it's also closed cycle. Not, so that is indeed there is three issues: well to wheel, tank to wheel, and your tailpipe uh, emission. Yes, correct. So uh, there is another question here, I think. Um, yeah. Oh yes, <laughs> the question to you is indeed, uh, uh, if we pose the question to you, whether you then could repeat the question for the participants. Ah, okay. Yes, received two yeah. questions. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, well, this is, let's say, through our channel, live stream channel, I think uh, one of our colleagues have sent you directly um, questions, I think via WhatsApp or via email. Yeah. Or, uh, 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 so if you could have a look at those and then repeat these questions and give them to us. This, so this is a kind of a fourth dimension to this live stream, so to say. <laughs> yes. Uh, so basically there were two questions, uh, both related to power density. Uh, one question states, uh, 
please explain the power density of lean burn engine. Um, for the lean burn engine, it is uh, pretty high for high efficiency and limits from the turbo. Uh, but perhaps you know how these can be overcome. And the second one is uh, also related um, to uh, reducing the loss of power density, uh, where it is stated that reducing lambda um, will increase NOx. And uh, the use of direct injection may also increase NOx uh, due to shorter mixing times and, uh, and ridge zones. Um, so firstly, uh, the loss of power density. Um, the main reason for the loss is the displacement of the air by, uh, by hydrogen, uh, so such that you cannot put um, all the hydrogen in together with uh, uh, the air that you want at a certain lambda, which makes that um, the power that you can achieve is reduced, also because there are limits uh, to your turbo, to your air path. Um, ways to mitigate that uh, is by, for example, um, replacing some of the air by EGR. If you do that, uh, it is correctly stated, yeah, lambda uh, uh, reduces again, which um, might result in more NOx, but the, uh, the recirculated excess gas, as we all know, is a, is a good measure to reduce the NOx again, which in the end uh, may limit the penalty on NOx. Furthermore, the, the use of EGR uh, with water uh, with also a bit of NOx uh, in it uh, is a good way to extend the, uh, the NOx limit a bit so that you uh, uh, can achieve higher uh, power output, which of course then increases power density. Uh, direct injection on the other hand, um, yeah, then you are not replacing any air at all. So uh, you can run a lambda two and a half and then uh, uh, put in the desired amount of hydrogen directly into the combustion chamber, so not into the manifold, not replacing any air, which allows you to uh, have uh, an increased power density. And that effect is, is dominant over uh, a loss that you might have by uh, reduced mixing times, uh, which could result in, uh, in stratified mixtures, uh, maybe even some ridge zones where uh, NOx uh, emission might still uh, occur. So there, uh, the increase in, in power density is uh, by the um, elimination of the replacement of air by hydrogen is, is the dominant factor. Thank you, uh, Thunder. Thank you for this uh, explanation to these questions. Um, I understand we have a, uh, 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 room for one more question, and this question goes to Max. So thank you, uh, Xander, once again. Um, we're now going to reconnect with Max uh, for a last question, and then we are about to close off this uh, seminar. Hi, Max. Max is frozen. We are just waiting for the connection with uh, Max for the time being. Ma ah, hi, Max. Yes. Hi. Okay. There is a question here, uh, and that says, why embrace hydrazine? Uh, because diesel and DME have a higher energy density. Could you yeah. uh, detail about that? Yeah, I think, um, why embrace hydrogen when uh, there's... Hydrazine, eh? your, your, your formic acid uh, product. Yeah, I understand. Okay. But um, hydrogen, oh, sorry, hydrazine, is actually a hydrogen carrier and it's best to use for a fuel cell um, and DME and diesel yeah, obviously cannot be used for that so um, I stated in my presentation that it is possible to use the combination gas uh, that's produced from hydrogen in a combustion engine but I think it's indeed favorable to to use diesel or DME in, in, in a combustion engine so um, yeah, I think I think that is the answer uh, okay. to that. Yeah. So use it in a fuel cell and not in in a combustion engine. Then okay. 
I think that explains a lot of everything. Well, thank you for that clarification, uh, Max. Yes. Thank you. Um, then I am about to close off now um, this uh, webinar. We have seen um, a, a very wide range of uh, presentations of how hydrogen might, let's say, be used in the transport sector. Um, the slides uh, are available via our uh, website. Um, also, the uh, live stream will, uh, at some point in time, be available for those who missed it now. Uh, but I would like to thank all of you participants for your presence, Edith. Even though we can't see you in, in, in real life, we very much appreciate that you have been here and listening. And uh, from the questions that we saw uh, coming in, we have seen that you have been uh, active and reactive. So thank you very much for that. Um, furthermore, I would like to thank, of course, Bart for his uh, hosting uh, of the event and for asking some uh, some uh, interesting questions also to the to the presenters. Of course, I have to uh, thank our um, our presenters as well. So Richard, Stefan, Alexander, uh, Peter, Max, and Ilko. Uh, many thanks to you um, for sharing your views on this. Um, then some last words. I think uh, a special uh, thanks should go to Peter van Gompel of TNO. He actually ignited this workshop. When he started to think of uh, together with Luis of well, how could we uh, 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 bring this topic under consideration? Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Luis Knotter, uh, also from the platform Sustainable Biofuels, also in in setting up the and designing this workshop, both from content side as in the way we presented to you. I would like to thank Leon van Wezenbeek because of his excellent technical support to make it happen as well. And uh, again, all participants, thank you. Uh, stay connected, stay safe in this time, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a next webinar or any other next event related to sustaining and making transport more climate neutral. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.